Good evening. Welcome back. So tonight we are very excited to have uh, Dr. Vas Bailey to come back to speak with us. We have all met him over the um, Skype call when we have the alumni night. And obviously, there's a lot of uh, positive response. I know quite a few of us started contacting Dr. Bailey right after the talk. So we're excited to have him to come back. Uh, it will be an interactive kind of a, a discussion. So feel free to raise your hand if you have questions about whatever uh, uh, Dr. Bailey is going to talk about. I invited him back to talk about the entire journey um, that he has gone through from sitting among one of you being one of the BME 180 students, the very first class yeah. in BME, all the way now to a very successful entrepreneurial uh, private investor. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Bailey. Thank you. In, in order to just make this session a little different, let's put away our recording devices, laptops. We don't need it. And for those who don't make eye contact with me, I'll be picking on you the entire evening. So, uh, because here's the thing, I took two hours and 25 minutes in the rain to come down here, so I definitely wanna make it worth my time and worth your time. So let's have a conversation. And this is a safe space, so feel free to ask me as many questions as you'd like. And what I'd like to share to all of you is the fact that there are many options as you leave a school like UCI. And there are only a few options that we get to discuss while we're here in school. And it seems like the world is quite limiting to what we can or cannot do. And what I'm here today, and hopefully if I do my job right, is to let all of you know that pretty much anything is possible, especially after you leave a school like UCI. Don't feel limited, but feel very empowered. And that's the message I'd like to let you all like, leave today. But not just that, but to tell you how you can go about doing that. And it's especially important for you to know that I don't come from a family that's well-connected. I come from a family with a single mother, uh, from middle class, she's a teacher. I have no business connections in my family. And I went on to build what is today the largest network of ex-CEOs in the world. Uh, and I'll take you through my little bit of a journey and tell you what I've been able to do, but uh, maybe we'll start there. So I'm Vas Bailey. I'm an investor with Artist Ventures. Uh, it's a venture fund based in San Francisco. Uh, if you were to think about the funds in terms of like our first fund, it's one of the top 5% of all funds in the world in terms of distributed capital. Uh, we are the Series B lead in a company which was started by two guys over a pizza store that were hoping to share video files easily. Uh, you may all know it, it's called YouTube. So we led the round in YouTube and it was sold nine months later to Google. We also were the first institutional investors in a company called Stemcentrix. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, Stemcentrix is the largest exit in venture capital history in life sciences. So we sold Stemcentrix for $10.2 billion to AbbVie. So anyone here in the health or life sciences space, if you're thinking about a startup, it is the best exit to date in the world of startups. And our fund led that round. And so that's a little bit about my fund and who I am. I'm the healthcare partner. Uh, I did get my undergrad at UCI, but not only that, but I had the privilege of working in Dr. Tang's lab, which was one of the best experiences of my life still, which is why he picks up the phone and tells me to come here. I'll, I'll drop everything and come down. And because uh, it's definitely a building block of like my own career. Uh, past the world of UCI, I did apply for many jobs. I think I applied for over maybe 50 jobs. I tried for internships as well. And I got zero internships because I couldn't, I just didn't even get interviews. I applied for jobs past UCI and I couldn't get a job. And this is with, I graduated magna cum laude, uh, and I graduated with like a 3.9 something engineering GPA. I had a publication with Dr. Tang. Uh, I was a, a Hodson Foundation fellow, a Medtronic fellow, all these things. I couldn't get a job after, it was the worst maybe market, or I was an international student, but a bunch of things. and. So I do want to talk about the whole process of searching for a job as well, because the truth is I realized even early, early on that 
No matter what you do to make your resume great, some of it comes down to the world of networking and the people you know and who you can, who you can talk to. It isn't just about that piece of paper where you just apply on a website. Yeah, some people do get that and they get the job of their dreams, but unfortunately, it's not like maybe I could have gotten a job, but it definitely wouldn't have been the job that I wanted to do. So past my world at UCI, I went on to uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where I got my PhD in biomedical engineering. So it was still a little bit linked to like what I did with my undergrad, those MEMS, but I went even smaller. I did nanotechnology. I used uh, quantum dots and quantum dot fret. I worked with uh, nanotechnology for the early detection of cancer. My PhD work is licensed. It was an applied PhD program uh, in the sense that I worked on patients, but then past that, my PhD work is currently being used by Merck, Millipore, and Cepheid. It's kind of nice like many years later when you still get a check from your licensed PhD work, which is really nice. So that was my PhD work. Uh, I finished my PhD world, and then I went on to McKinsey and Company. Anyone here familiar with that, McKinsey? Yep. No one else here. Oh, there we go, a few people here. Uh, are you guys familiar with Deloitte? How many people are familiar with Deloitte? OK, uh, Accenture, hands? OK, uh, see, that's a whole other world out there past you when you finish your undergrad. It's consulting. And the, the top three consulting companies, McKinsey, BCG, and Bain, which largely are management consulting companies. And the management consulting companies work with CEOs directly. So I, I'll give you a sense of what I did there. I, I worked with the CEO of Pfizer in deciding what new drugs to make. I worked on the merger of Millennium Pharmaceuticals and Takeda. I worked with Philips on launching the first LED light bulb in the United States. And some of it was fun. I got to watch people shop for light bulbs. Uh, in the pharma space, I had to understand various mechanisms of actions and figure out which new therapeutic areas were interesting enough for Pfizer to get into. But that was my world in McKinsey. While I was at McKinsey, I had a chance to, one of my clients was the CEO of Pfizer, Jeff Kindler. And one day, he was no longer the CEO of Pfizer. He was uh, given his golden parachute. Do you guys know what golden parachute is? Yeah, he was fired uh, from his role as Pfizer and given a lot of money. And he couldn't serve in pharma for a little bit, so we started a company together. And my co-founders were the CEO of AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, and Teva Pharmaceuticals. We built what is today the largest network of ex-CEOs in the world. So we brought in the ex-CEO of Walmart, HSBC, uh, Best Buy. We also brought in like Scott Gottlieb, the former commissioner of FDA, used to work in that network for me. And we built 1,500 former executives. And we would go to current CEOs, so we go to current CEO of Allergan and say, what problems do you have? And hook them up with the people who had been in their shoes before. And we connected, we're a broker of people, and we charged a lot of money, because retired people have all the time, and current CEOs want to talk to retired folks. So we went from zero to 40 million in two years. That's now part of the GLG Institute in New York and GLG. So that was my little bit of world in, uh, in, in the world of building, and I loved it. So I started another data analytics AI company, which answered, what makes the best salesperson the best salesperson? We analyzed review data to be able to tell you that. I sold that company to an uh, Israeli real estate company. And then past that world, I moved back to San Francisco. And I started working with Artist Ventures. And while I was there, I helped them figure out for their hardest companies that are not making money, how to make money for those companies. So I love the world of sales. Sales gets a bad rep, and I think it's actually phenomenal. It allows me to meet people and build that network I never had. And so that's what I did for artists as I looked at healthcare deals. And since then, all I do now is look for innovative healthcare companies. I invest in things all the way from, I think you had seen the CEO of Echo had come out here. I don't know if you met with Echo. Anyone know Echo? It's a digital stethoscope. Uh, they have the largest database of human sounds, heart sounds, lung sounds. They use machine learning to tell you when you have an aberration all the way to real therapeutics. Anyone know what gene editing or CRISPR is? Yeah, okay, few. So uh, I have two gene editing companies, including one that we just announced last week. We just did a $820 million deal with Johnson & Johnson. But uh, it, you can see a whole spectrum. But 
I'm going to pause there. At least now you have a sense of my bio. So there are a variety of things you can talk to, I can talk to you about. I can talk to you about like the startup world. Oh, there is another part. While I was at Hopkins, I tried to start a nonprofit. And uh, it was a total failure. Uh, I raised some money, but uh, what I realized was I didn't have any real skill sets to be that valuable or MVP. I still think at some point I would like to give back and work in that space, but I just don't think that if you don't have the capital to do it, and at that point I was still in school, I think it's a hard space to tackle. So I've seen the world of startups, I've seen the world of academia, I've seen the world of consulting, seen the world of venture capital, and that's what I'd like to be able to talk to you today. One, to tell you that there are options. Two, that I've seen some of these options. And three, these options are available to you, so let's talk about you. So maybe we can start with a question, and then we can have, I can go into a little detail into each of these things and, and talk more. Hi. Uh, transitioning from academics to entrepreneurial, there are certain skills that we won't have. Could you elaborate on some of those? So the question is talking about like the world of academia as you leave. And are you talking about after undergrad when you've done academic work, or are you talking about a graduate degree? Uh, undergraduate or graduate. Um, specifically graduate in my question, but perhaps undergraduate is also relevant. OK. So the question is, uh, how does the transition work? For a large part, many people, I'll use the only word, which is inertia. When you finish your graduate program, oftentimes you choose the job as a scientist at Edwards Life Sciences or an engineer at Edwards, not because it's a bad company. Edwards is a great company. But I think sometimes we do it not because we think that's our dream job, but we do it because we think that that's what's available to us. And that's what we're told or taught we should do. What I would challenge all of you is ask yourselves, really, is that what you want to do? And if not, like, don't do it. And part of the transition is it's tough because I think you're put into a position where you don't have a, a whole circle of people who have experienced what it's like. If you are leaving an academic world and joining a business world, you're constantly judged because people always think that you somehow have a master's degree and spent two years at like a business school somewhere and suddenly you're the expert in business, which is not true. But people think that, and they always judge and think that academics can't think or process. But you will get judged for that and be prepared for it. And the third is, I think that in general, I've seen academics are really bad at negotiating pay packages. So when you go into your work, academics almost feel like just so grateful for having a job that they're like, oh, yeah, when can I start? I'll take the job for whatever price, which is the very opposite of what someone from business school would do. They'd say, oh, can you pay me $10,000 more? So one other thing to keep in mind is, uh, as you transition is to really value yourself. Because I think that each of us here have something which is unique. And I call that like a spike. And maybe your spike is connecting with people or being bold enough to ask the first question in this room. And yet others, maybe someone sitting at the back there processing, and maybe at this point, this doesn't seem that interesting to them because they already have something in mind. Or maybe their spike is the fact that they're really good at making music. And it, it doesn't matter. But what is important is to actually find what you're really good at. And don't think that you can conquer everything. There are a lot of things that you will never be good at. Like for me, do you guys know what Myers-Briggs or the, their various personality tests? How many of you know what that is? OK, awesome. Uh, my Myers-Briggs is ENTP. And if you think about the world of in business, the J versus P in the end, for those of you who don't know, uh, think of it this way. If you go into the grocery store, if you're making a shopping list, you're probably a J. And I'm never a, I've never been a list keeper. I'm not the person who is the most organized in that way. I do things and just, uh, just, but I've had to adapt. And that is the same thing in the world of people leaving the world of research. I think most of people are actually pretty organized in the way it is. I was never a good fit for academia. I think it was uh, the other way around. But it's, uh, it's worth like knowing what you're good at. And don't try and you can't win everything. I don't think I'll ever suddenly evolve and be trained to become the most organized person in the world. It just won't happen. I don't think I'll ever be, become a person who is going to write great code. I've tried. I've taken C, C++, and I suck at it. 
Like, I am really objectively probably the worst programmer you can ever, like, put. And I know it's, like, an embarrassment because people just see, it, oh, brown guy, he should be able to code, and I can't do it. I just can't. Uh, and it doesn't work. And, but I can do sales. I, I can try and take a product and tell you how to make money from it. And so find, like, what you're really good at. And don't be embarrassed at what your skill set is. And maybe if you are an introvert, maybe the idea is you don't want to do this in a group setting, but maybe you're great at like one-on-one -on -one and taking someone out for coffee and you build trust really quickly. Use that to build your career. So I think part of it is early on, as you're, whether you're a junior in college or in grad school, start thinking about what you're really good at and don't be embarrassed to think about what you're really good at. Find your one spike. And as you leave academia, as leaving undergrad or grad school, try and capitalize and let that be a selling point for whatever you choose next. Does that like answer? Anyone have a follow-up question to that? Or yeah. What were some key moments? It's a mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the beach. Uh, what were some key moments that took you from the world of academia to industries, especially uh, venture capitalism and entrepreneurship? Um, the question was, why, why venture capital? Why entrepreneurship? Um, I think the first part is the dollars in industry were a lot more appealing to me than, I'm just being very honest, right? Safe space, like, so this is, you, you, you will get things unfiltered. Like, it, it, was, it was hard. Like, in the PhD world, like, you were getting paid $28,000. I think, first of all, in this country, it's ridiculous how much we pay residents, PhD students, postdocs, it's, it's really unfair. For the kind of quality of like, brain power that people are contributing, like, it, I think it's ridiculous. Like, it's not fair in a way. And part of it is like I was thinking when, I, like I mentioned, I, have, I knew I had to support my family at some point and send money back, to, whether it's to India or to my sister. I, I wanted to be in a position where I could do that. And with a $28,000 salary, you can't really do anything. So my whole goal was to get through my PhD as quickly as possible. I really enjoyed my PhD. I really enjoyed the work I was doing. I really enjoyed the intellectual challenge. And I don't know, maybe if there was a path that you could have suddenly finished your PhD and gotten, uh, so let's talk like actual dollars, because I think sometimes people are too embarrassed to talk what real dollars are, like where, where things are. So my job after that $28,000, after the, under, uh, the graduate school world, my very first job, my overall pay package at McKinsey with zero years of work experience with a $200,000 package. Yeah, so that's a significant jump for someone with zero days of work experience. So if you were to ask me, like, should I take a postdoc for $44,000 and live in San Francisco? I don't know, it's a really hard question. I don't, I, what about the people here who are in academia? I, I would say, what would you say, how would you convince people to stay, to go on to do a postdoc? <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Kang did the postdoc. I did not. Yeah. I yeah. didn't do a postdoc. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of married to science, and you guys also my indigo assessment, right? I'm a lifelong learner. All I want to do is learn. So I took the crappy job of a postdoc, <laughs> and yes, I got $44,000 a year. It still hasn't changed. And yeah, I did it because I wanted to advance my own knowledge of clinical research and learn how to actually run clinical trials. But part of my PhD work was getting things off the ground from feasibility testing to phase zeros. So this is figuring out whether or not stuff works. But I want to actually make it get to the next stage, get to the next impact. So I took the crappy job because I wanted to see my device actually on someone in a clinical trial. And so, yeah, I think it really just depends on the personality. And, and like, I think yeah, there are a variety someone... of ways. Let's talk about that a little more, yeah. right? Because I think that in the world of venture capital, I still get to support real science and still yeah. see things go into clinic. And I do that by not having to do that. And I think it's, let's just fundamentally say it's unfair yeah. that someone is getting paid $44,000. Like that, <laughs> hopefully we'll all agree. I For the quality of work you do, no one should be paid that. So I think the system itself is broken. Yeah. But I fundamentally think that it's hard. Like, I mean, and maybe there's some who are privileged enough to be able, or, and there's some who do it because of the love of science. Just love golf. <laughs> and I am a terrible salesperson. So <laughs> that doesn't help. Yeah. So instead, I married a salesperson. That's how I was able to get over <laughs> the fact that I don't make a lot of money. That's another option. <laughs>
But thank you for sharing. And I think that's partly, it's a, it's a struggle. And like for me, I, I love science too. And unfortunately, I, sometimes you have life as well. And I don't think I could have been in a position to pursue that no matter how much I loved it because I couldn't see another 10 years of my life where I couldn't figure that out. And, and it, it's tough. Yeah. And someone had a question there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned you went from your PhD to uh, working at McKinsey with zero work experience. Could you, you know, tell us how you were able to <laughs> get there? <laughs> um, so McKinsey does school recruiting and at that point, Johns Hopkins was not a school McKinsey was recruiting from. So what I did is when I was looking for jobs after my PhD, and you wanted to be in business, again, only jobs I applied were in business and consulting, I started looking for everyone in the world of PhD who had gone on from PhD into the world of consulting. I happened to find like most of the people there who went on to consulting at McKinsey were Harvard in the East Coast, I was in the East Coast, Harvard, Penn and Columbia. And I found people, or and MIT. So I found these people and I started talking to them. And there is a very rigorous case study and interview process. Uh, I think there was like maybe, I went through 12 rounds of interviews before I got the job on three separate days, including a written test to qualify. So it was a really tough process. And just so you know, even after my PhD, even after being a a Siebel Scholar and having all of the other things. I published quite a bit. I think I had over 30 something publications, I have four patents. Uh, I still applied to maybe 30 something jobs. I had nine interviews and six rejections of those nine interviews and one job offer. So I'm not going to say it's easy either, and I don't know. I'm not going to also say there's a magic formula, but I think there is definitely one thing which I do see is that. Talking to people absolutely helped. What really got me into that is setting myself up by knowing what the interview process was and already going into the interview, telling them that I knew exactly what my McKinsey experience was gonna be like. It wasn't like me saying, oh, tell me about this firm. Uh, are you, do you think this is a good fit? I'm always, I, I was like, yes, absolutely, I know. I've spoken to Sarah and John and Jill and this is absolutely gonna be the perfect role for me. I can't think of anything else. And I think that was my McKinsey interview. When I went in, I was very confident in knowing that that is the only job I wanted to do. And again, keep in mind that I, I, am, I was at that point an international student, which does restrict me because employers have to sponsor my visa to be in the country. So your life may be very different because as US citizens, you have access to a variety of other companies. So maybe, maybe not. But, uh, I don't think independently, it doesn't matter though, because I think irrespective, you should be networking with people. And the truth is with LinkedIn, like if you are interested, and even if you're not interested to eliminate something, set yourselves up with like coffee dates or beer dates or whatever you want with people who are, who are in the field. And it could be the one-on-one, -on -one. how many of you are taking on, like talk to a postdoc and understand what you like. I'll tell you the things of why you should do a postdoc. Like it gives you the creative freedom to really pursue a scientific problem that no one else in the world can focus on. And she is the expert in that small scientific field, and she is the world's expert in that. And that is the beauty of following a postdoc, because no one else can do what she does. And that's the truth. And that's... <laughs> but the PhD in postdoc world gets you to that level of expertise and gives you the creative freedom to pursue something on your own time, which I think is really beautiful. And so I can say one of the best things about my PhD world is I was... 13 pounds lighter. I went to the gym twice a day sometimes, and it was incredible, uh, which is much harder to do in, like a, in, in the work world. And so that, that was, you control your own life, and which is to a large part in venture capital, you control your own life as well. But McKinsey, I worked every weekend that entire year, the first year, every weekend. I took zero days of vacation. And my days were typically 7.30 in the morning till maybe midnight. A little bit of a trade-off. I don't know if like necessarily every PhD student or postdoc would work those hours. Yeah. Just following up on that, um, why were your work hours so unique 
um, and that you were like, were you just, did you set your own goals or did you have team goals that you were meeting? So at McKinsey, you have no control of your life. You get put on a project, you're an associate or an analyst, and you're told what to do. Uh, I remember when I started off, uh, I wanted to volunteer. I was teaching adults uh, who had never gone to school math. And it was really fun. It was volunteer work, and I loved doing it. Every Wednesday, I would do it. So I told McKinsey and my team, uh, I'm going to continue doing this Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30. And they, said, they laughed at me, and they said, absolutely not. They said, you will not have any time for it. So I did not have time for it. I did not do any volunteer work. I couldn't go to my friend's weddings. I couldn't go. You just can't. Like, and the minute they see that you are able to do that, you probably will not have a job there for a long time. So, and it's the truth. It's Bain, BCG as well. I think it's meant for people who are constantly threatened that they're not going to make it up. They play on your insecurities of not being the best. And they capitalize and they made a business out of it. But everyone I know there have like, worked insane hours. And it's by and large, it becomes the norm. Like, I remember those were the days of the Blackberry, which I don't think many of you would have even, but it had the green flashing light. I would sometimes wake up at 3 in the morning looking at the green flashing light saying, oh, crap, I have an email that I have to respond to. And I would have to respond. I was also taught that to respond to an email within the first five minutes of getting it. So you're so trained. Like, you're just like, even now, it's just like, boom, you have to respond back. But that is a very different life. And the money is good. Like, the 200K is a starting after you finish a PhD. Like, you can pretty quickly move up to like 400 to 500K very, very easily. And that's the same world as finance. Like, I have friends who've left the PhD world and gone on to the world of finance, and they were, three years after their PhD, were making it close to a million dollars. So, but their lives, like, I probably never saw them, ever. Yeah, so, uh, and if it was, it would be like one quick night of binge drinking, and that's probably it. You probably would never see them at all. Like, that, that is, like the, the life of what it is there. So it's a pros and cons and trade-offs of what you want in your life, right? Because a lot of people said, is this really worth it? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm really, like, I'm falling sick more. I don't get to see my family. Is that what you want to do? And some people choose to do it, and some people it's not worth it. Any other questions? In terms of soft skills that we might not have right now? So soft skills to gain while you're an undergrad. Uh, the best way to describe it is I think as you go through your undergraduate careers, each of you are making like a mini ad, like a television ad, if you want to think, think of it, for your lives. And each of you have a chance to describe who you are. The problem is, Especially like a school at UCI, same with UC San Diego, as people graduate from here, all your TV ads about yourselves look the same. It's really hard to dif distinguish between person A and person B. Let me tell you if this like, sort of makes sense. Each of you probably have done like some amount of undergraduate research or some project or you use your design team project with like the world of Edwards or Medtronic or something like that, you highlight that. You each have that. You each have like pretty decent GPA. You highlight your classes. Then you put your extracurricular activities in it, and that's your resume. And honestly, like as you think about like your brand and your personal brand and who you each of you are, like you need to think about doing something a little bit different. Because otherwise, it's like, when you have an undifferentiated marketplace and all your ads are the same, it's hard to know what to buy or hard to know who to, who to hire. And so it comes to the world of soft skills. And it comes to the world of personal branding. So what do you do? I think the biggest thing in a school like UCI, the class sizes here have gotten bigger. You have to continuous, continuously try to push yourself to differentiate who you are. And part of that comes from where I see people doing innovative things, where, where I've seen people who have tried to start companies and it doesn't matter if you've failed, you've tried. I've seen people do interesting things where they've done uh, entrepreneurship in a foreign country. They've done a finance internship. They've done things that just make them look a little bit different. Now, if it depends on what path you want to take. 
If you want to go into the research path, all of that is pretty dangerous. I'd say you're better off sticking to a traditional doing research in undergrad, showing that you can publish a paper, present a poster somewhere at a symposium. That'll help you move to your next step. But if you're looking to get business jobs, I'd say try and be as different as possible. And try and showcase that you are. Soft skills wise, the simplest thing I'd say is the ability to connect with an individual, both your peers in school, as well as people in the outside world, whether or not they're UCI alumni. And the whole soft skill of networking is an art. And it's not limited to people who are extroverts. It can be something which comes as easily to someone who is an introvert. When I studied with the CEO network I built, what the world of CEOs in the United States of Fortune 500 companies are. We took a survey of a random sampling of 120 CEOs. And what we found is there's no personality type that is dominant for the CEOs today. There's no school. It's not that the top CEOs in our country come from Harvard and MIT. They come from all over, from community colleges to state colleges to universities. Like, so there is nothing. Income has no, no tell on who, what the CEO is. But what is the one common thing is each of the CEOs who made it to the top, one, had an incredible work ethic, and two, had both a mentor and a sponsor. How many of you know what the difference between a mentor and a sponsor is? OK, let's hear it. OK, so it's, it's great. In terms of like the mentor and sponsor, it's, it's exactly in that direction. There's that small difference. A mentor is someone who will make time for you and say, let's get coffee. I will talk to you. Let's construct your plan. A sponsor is someone who will, will positively endorse you and promote you even when you're not in the room. It's an important nuance. Does everyone get it? Because that is a really important difference, and especially for the women in the audience, I'm on the board of the Association for Women in Science, or AWIS, which is the largest organization for women in STEM. And there are two male allies on the board. It's the largest chapter for women in STEM, and we're the oldest organization. The biggest difference for why women don't make it up in business either is you typically have mentors, but not sponsors. And it's important. And that goes to the same for people who go to public universities. You may find and you'll have someone who'll take the time to help you with your career and help you with your resume. Not enough. Like, the real thing is, is Dr. Tang calling someone actively and saying, wow, I think that Jill's amazing and you should be hiring her. How many people in your lives have you cultivated who will actively promote you whether or not you're there in the room with them? And if not, search harder. Because you will find those people and for me, a large part that I attribute my success is not. You can't do everything by yourself. Jeff Kindler was my sponsor, the ex-CEO of Pfizer. I built a relationship with him not because I'm special or not because I'm smarter than the other people at McKinsey. Absolutely not. But one, I am definitely genuine, and I will work with him for what he wants. But two, I'm just grateful for the fact that he believed or saw something in me that he wanted to sponsor me and talk about me even when I was not in the room which is the same thing that happened in the world of McKinsey. It's the same thing that happened of how I got my job in venture capital. And pretty much a sequence of events has always been that I've always had mentors in my life, but the key difference is that someone always took the time to fight for me and fight my battles for me. If you're fighting every battle for yourself, you're doing something wrong. And coming back to that stat for especially women in a workplace, for a large part, you go through like some seminar where they're talking and coaching women saying, oh, women don't negotiate hard for their salaries. So you overcompensate for fighting your own battle. And then you say, oh, I think I should be paid more. But it makes you, it puts you in a worse place because you're actually fighting your own battle. Find someone else to fight that battle for you and your life is a lot easier. So, and while that stat is for women, I think it's the same for men as well. Like I think as you try to move up in a career, always try and find that. The other soft skills that I'd say really quickly to finish that question is I'd say it is worth like also thinking about uh, working on building trust, trust and, and understanding how to 
invoke trust in other people, including peers. Sometimes we overlook, and especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, if any of you are starting things, I often see uh, one soft skill that is missing is everyone's trying to fight for themselves. I'd say it's, life is not a fight where you only have to take care of yourself. You can do things where you can collectively promote your friends as well. Like, and it is a track record you build on your personal brand. So another soft skill is, it's, it's, it's difficult, but how do you invoke that everyone around you, from your friends in your life, to the people you are dating, to your parents, to your kids, to whatever else you have in your life, believe and trust in what you do? And that's a really tough one to build, but it's a great soft skill to figure out how to get there. Yeah, uh, sort of build, up, uh, build upon that a little bit. You mentioned about the three factors that are common to the successful CEOs. Number one, incredible work ethics, mentor, and sponsor. I wonder, as I was listening to you, whether the work ethics aspect of it would um, line you up with a great sponsor who look at your work ethics and say, okay, I'm gonna promote fast whenever I see people. Do you see that link there? Unfortunately, I wish I would say the answer is yes. Uh, a lot of people who work really hard often become the minion or like the person who you pawn off your work to and they never move forward in life. So it's a little bit more than work ethic. I think work ethic is the basic stepping stone. So without that, yes, you cannot move up. But it also comes down to some amount of personality and cultivating relationships. So do you have the ability to cultivate a real relationship? And it doesn't have to be a whole host of people. You don't have to be flashy. But I think it's related to, do people, OK, maybe the work ethic, do people recognize that your work ethic is so strong that it's worth putting their own neck out for you? And so maybe that, that's the small link. But I've often seen people in small companies, like in startups, as well as large companies like a Pfizer, where the hardest working person stays in that role, because the fear is, if you promote that person, no one's going to be doing all that work. Then you have to find someone else who's doing the work of two other people. So there is a little bit of politicking, but I'm sure it's the same with like in the world of faculty members who move up for tenureship. I don't know if it's necessarily the person who is uh, working the hardest who makes it as a full tenure. I think there's a, a little bit of how you brand yourselves. It's a little bit of like how you showcase some of your best research. Is that, is that fair, or even as you think about the world of academia? So it's not work ethic by itself. So I think it's, a, it's probably a very similar analog. It's, it's much more than, than just work ethic. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned how you lacked a specific skill set for starting a nonprofit. What would you say the, the characteristics and traits of that specific skill set that you were like missing are? Yeah, the one thing, and this is really important, if you could change, and if all of you could do this, uh, if you wanted to start a nonprofit, how many of you want to start a nonprofit here? Okay. The best thing for you to do, and you should try and do that today, is win a lottery. It is incredible. When you have that money, you should be doing that nonprofit. It's so great. Like, I wish I had done that. Like, I just didn't win that lottery. Uh, but part of it, it, on a serious note, is it's, if I were to look at the room and you guys were running a nonprofit to help X person, what makes you the world's best person to run that nonprofit, apart from your passion? What can you really do? Can you push the science forward? Have you actually come up with a breakthrough? Let's just say you're working on uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. What makes you the best DMT nonprofit person ever? There are a couple things that come to nonprofits. One, fundraising, which is giant boondoggles. Can you raise millions and millions of dollars? I, I look at a nonprofit, which is, uh, I've in invested in a company in the CRISPR-Cas9 space, which has the first cure for viral platforms, including HIV, in an animal model. And we were trying to get the, some of the HIV foundations to come work with us. But you see, they don't even, like to them, it's a giant boondoggle where they have to have this every year, this giant gala that they bring people together and they raise money. I'm not saying they don't do good things for people. They do, absolutely do. But a huge first component is fundraising and getting people pumped for what you're doing. 
A second part is having the access of some sponsored programs that you fund. Uh, and a third part is just pure operations of being able to run it. Like, it's not that it's, you, you do it because you're passionate about the space, but eventually, with the world of nonprofits, the people who are successful and run good nonprofits actually have a, a way to change policy, a way to change, if it's a pharma uh, healthcare one, change how drugs are being paid for. And unfortunately, as a 22-year-old, a 23-year-old at that point, I don't think I could have moved the paradigm of making a real difference in the lives of those patients. And maybe it's a skeptic in me, and maybe you can, so it's not to say you shouldn't do it, but I didn't have deep pockets either. I started my nonprofit because it was in India where I said, wow, 80% of disposable income is lost by people who leave villages to come into the city uh, for healthcare. So I'd have these vans that would have medicines in it that you can just drive to the villages and dispense money. Uh, raised a bunch of money, uh, started my first van, got like pharma companies to give drugs that they donated, and within the first month, the person who I had to, to run the operation stole the van and the, and the drugs. And I'm sitting in the States saying, oh, crap, this sucks. So what I did is what any entrepreneur does, I just raised money again, bought a second van, and this time I'm like, ah, I'll have a supervisor to make sure that there is, they're going to keep an eye on everything. The supervisor and the manager stole this stuff the second time. <laughs> So I'm like, OK, this is like, and that was my experience, right? Like, so it colors what I could do. Maybe the right thing is I should have moved there and done it. But again, that, that was not right for me. Uh, but perhaps there are others who tackle it and do a great job with it. But try and win that lottery. Questions? Um, when a team is pitching an idea uh, to you, uh, I know it's important to have a variety of different skill sets and experiences. Uh, for a team that is kind of fresh out of school and are looking for like mentorship or guideship, what would you recommend? I'm so glad I got this question because this is actually what I wanted to come back and tell UCI. So my last few deals have all come from the UC system. So it's different for a fund. I, I have not funded a Harvard startup or a Stanford startup. All my, my, my last two deals came from UC Santa Cruz. I also have one company which is from UCI. And it's right here. I don't know if, have you heard about, uh, uh, maybe not shared too much about that, but it's, uh, it came from the physics world. It was a tri-alpha energy. Has anyone heard of that? But they have a healthcare application. So we led the round in uh, TAE Life Sciences which is uh, they built a, a fusion reactor that shoots neutron beams, and they have the first non-toxic way to treat uh, cancer. So it's uh, instead of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which kill normal cells and tumor cells, this is a non-toxic way. They're using a technique called BNCT, a boron neutron capture therapy. Yeah, it's a UCI start, and it's, it's great to have funded a UCI startup and happy to be in this ecosystem. But I love that question because one of my biggest frustrations with the world of UCI and UCLA, uh, not UC San Diego or Berkeley, I think they've done a much better job at it, is uh, I oftentimes feel that the solution set of what, for me, right, what I can fund, is it's too narrow. Usually what I see at UCI is an application. I don't see a real viable business. And by that, I mean a real business is it's not like a one product that can just make it, or one app that you build that connects a patient to a physician. I can't, someone can fund that. Maybe angels will fund that, but it's not something that I can do as a venture capitalist. It's really, really difficult. Speaking from my fund, the ideas that we want to tackle are category-defining ideas. So when we did YouTube, the reason why we were excited by YouTube was it fundamentally transformed and changed the way people accessed media or information or videos or learning, and there was nothing like it before. And so you could be in India or Africa, and you could access an MIT lecture. And that was really exciting to us. It would change the way of learning and video sharing forever. And we're not going to do more YouTubes now that we've done one. The reason why we did stem centrics was we were the first to bet on stem cell therapy in cancer when we had data to show that you could cure certain types of cancers with this 
ADCs, our antibody drug conjugates. And it was exciting to us. Uh, and the ideas that we see sometimes is from the world of UCI. I'll give you an example, and, and apologies if you're working on something like this, is you will see like one small image-based learning for a valve surgery. Or it's a new type of catheter which has a 12% improvement efficiency from the last catheter used. Now, is that a viable business? Perhaps it is. Is that something Edwards is interested in? Perhaps, yes, they are. But as a VC, it's hard to fund like one product that has a 12% improvement in a catheter technology to what already existed before. It isn't inspiring. Like, I would rather you say that you have found an alternative to using catheters completely. Why not dream a little bigger? And I don't know why it is. Are people afraid to dream here? Are people afraid that they're not going to get funded for it? Are people afraid that like, people will laugh at them if they thought bigger? Like, that is one beautiful thing of, of students coming out of Harvard or Stanford. Sometimes it's ridiculous. But I'm glad they at least think and take that leap of faith of wanting to transform something that is people at first glance say, no, you can't use an app to call a taxi. The taxi union is so strong. A medallion costs a million dollars. There's no way governments will let you hail a taxi using an app. Like, it's crazy. And to us, that was crazy. We passed on Uber when we saw it early. Because uh, we spoke to uh, Ga uh, Governor Newsom, uh, who at that point was mayor of San Francisco, and he said, we will never let this go through San Francisco. The, the unions will fight it. And we passed. We could, and we were like, this idea is going to take a lot of capital. It's never going to happen. But you know what? For those who did believe in that giant dream, they're going to make a lot of money from it. And it's great. Also, I'm sure all of you have used Uber at some point, right? It fundamentally transforms how you access. And it's great for us. That's our anti-portfolio. Things we didn't do now in retrospect seems great. So, what is the big idea, and what do you really care about really transforming? Don't take a class and then suddenly have learned something from your class and think of that as a small application and think of it as a giant business. Don't also focus on exit. A lot of UCI startups to me will come back and say, oh, you fund me in this round, my next round I'll, I'll raise this and I'll do an exit. I don't care about an exit. I want you to build the next billion dollar company, irrespective of thinking how we're going to return the dollars back to investors. Fundamentally, be passionate about what you're building and build it because you actually want to transform or you're unhappy with the way healthcare is today. For me personally, like I, I lost my dad to cardiac disease and it's always been something that I wanted to work on to be able to transform that and it's been a personal mission. To me, healthcare is very personal. It's also personal from the world of science to be an investor because I don't think that tech people who come in, tech investors who have done Airbnb, are the right people to work with regulated industry to bring something? Because you have the Theranoses of the world. Are you all familiar with Theranos? Irresponsible. Like, every healthcare person here would have seen through that, which is why no healthcare investor did Theranos. And we shouldn't, right? The bar for healthcare, because it, it affects us and affects lives, and maybe the Theranos was a large-scale sensationalized and we've heard about it. What about all these other irresponsible things that go to market? that don't have the protection that they're not like, eventually fed into. So I want to ask you all, like, is that something, like, let's talk about startups and the UCI space. Are, are there anyone here interested in entrepreneurship or the world of startups? OK, a few. So what is this group interested in, then? Because people are not interested in nonprofit. People are not interested in startups. How many of you want to go to grad school? OK. What is this group interested in? How many of you want to get a job? There you go. Still not anyone. So you didn't raise your hand. So what do you want to do? Grad school. What do, what do you want to do? Black jacket? Yeah. Get a job. OK. So by and large, and how many of you want to get a job in a medical device space? Pharma? Yeah, that's another thing that UCI and UC San Diego do not prepare people for. Like, all the jobs, and I know Dr. Tang is in the device diagnostics mem space, and it's a fun, great space. That's what I did my undergrad and my PhD in. But pharma is incredible as well. And the one problem is, in terms of innovation, in terms of like the larger exits, 
pharma and drug development is also equally great. So my advice to UCI for at least both the chem, chemical engineering and bioengineering, biomedical engineering, is also to have some flavor of the world of like pharma and drug development as part of the curriculum. Because that is one whole aspect that I think that the UCI undergrads don't get much exposure to, which is why maybe there are not many of you raising your hands at the world of like a pharma world. Because drug development, you all have taken a drug at some point in your life. I'm talking about like pharmaceutical drugs. And it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's great. Like I think in, in terms of it's needed, health will always, will, there will always be sickness. And there is some art to making the right drugs for the market. And I think that maybe that is another angle as bioengineers, biomedical engineers worth, or in this group is a mix, right, of chemical engineers and biomedical engineers. And what? And material, material science. Even a great material science or delivery. Delivery is the hottest thing that is being funded right now. Because we feel like we've understood all the targets. Material science and chemical engineers out here, there are delivery companies out there. How many of you are interested in working for and even know the names of 10 delivery companies? That's a whole other world out there. And these are billion dollar companies that all they do is figuring out how to deliver a payload to the target, how to have better targeting of drugs to a tumor. And that's all material science engineering. It's polymer science, it's the, which is a whole, whole other world out there. Uh, so it looks like in this world, maybe another task which I would say that encourage you as you think about like how much ever time you have left is try and think of a job outside of that one device company. Explore at least five companies outside of the device world that you're familiar with. Because it's important, and it's important for you all to set that trend so the future generations at UCI will have options beyond the world of Edwards, right? Like, let's try and move beyond that. And nothing against Edwards. I actually collaborated with Edwards last, and they're a great company. But it's, uh, it, it's worth like working and looking beyond. And so grad school, how many of you said grad school again? And is that like a, how many of you want to go into medical school? Wow, very, very small. So that is also unique about like the UCI world. So I teach at Hopkins undergrad, and there's a freshman course, which is called Real World and Biomedical Engineering. And when I ask people at Hopkins, how many of you want to go to medical school, about 60% of people raise their hands. So it, it is unique. So you have a competitive edge. So work on that and use that to go wherever you want to go and talk about how UCI, not many people go into perhaps from the engineering world into medical school. So that is an edge. Uh, and grad school wise, I would say the grad school experience is an incredible experience and gives you the time to really become the expert in what you want to do. If I had to do it all over again, I would absolutely do my, get my PhD again. It was, it, it, was, it was great. And it also helped differentiate me in the marketplace when I did graduate. It, it was, it's great, and it still comes in handy today. As I invest in companies, having a PhD, people take me a lot. Like, it's not that I know anything about, uh, let's, what am I getting pitched on uh, more recently, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, even ADCs, or uh, in terms of polymer science. I never spent any time on it. But just having this, what PhDs and the training does really well is it gives you the way to evaluate a scientific problem in a very rigorous way. And it's that scientific school of thought which can be very useful in evaluating problems, which I think is a good reason to consider it. That being said, for those of you who care about the dollars, uh, the PhD world does set you back. And my path is non-traditional, and so I made up for that. But for many others from my PhD world who are still moved on to industry now, they're way, way, way behind in terms of the pay gap compared to the undergrads who did not go into graduate school. So for what it's worth, I am not discouraging people from going, because I, I, like I said, I would do it all over again. But if it is the dollars you care about, and it doesn't matter if you want to go into business, if you want to move into something which is overly technical, you can go into an Allergan, and you can get into the executive leadership program or if you want to get scientific expertise in drug development, 
You can ask to get a mentor and a sponsor in the drug development world, and you can learn that. So you can get your mini PhD at an Allergan, at a Pfizer, at an Amgen, if you wanted to stay local. Yeah, so it is still possible. So just food for thought. And for those, when you get started, so let's talk about post-undergrad, what expectations are, what is real versus what is not. So if you're leaving the world of undergrad and you're looking at the world of consulting, you should expect the world of Deloitte Consulting to the ZS Associates. You should look at ZS as well, a pretty good company in, in the world of healthcare. Uh, ZS and Deloitte, they probably will pay you between sixty-five to $80,000 as a base salary. So that's what you should expect to be. If you do work at the world of like a McKinsey, BCG, or Bain after undergrad, you should expect to be between 75 and 110 is the ballpark of where you should be. If you're working for a startup, uh, if you're working for one of my startups, and let's say some of my startups include like Palantir and Quid, after undergrad, our starting salary for undergrads, irrespective of which school you went to, is usually 75 with a 20K bonus. Uh, for a startup, but this is a well-funded startup, which has had a VC-backed startup. If you're going to early stage startup, which is a series seed or series A with one or two million in funding, you should expect to get paid between forty-five and seventy thousand dollars. If you're going into the nonprofit world uh, after your undergrad, you should expect to get paid between twenty-five and forty thousand dollars. And grad school, we already talked about where we were. So I think most schools, irrespective of where you are, you're probably going to be at twenty-five to forty thousand dollars now, depending on where you are. Is that fair? Sounds about right. Yeah. So hopefully that's helpful, giving you a benchmark of what it is. And if you're going into med school or law school, you're going to be in a lot of debt. Yep. Yeah. What else can I answer and tackle? Any other questions? And what would you say was like your least favorite experience? So the best experience that I've had and my, my least favorite experience. Um, it's a really tough one. That's a great question. And I think that the best experience for me has been my world today. I, I get to work hand in hand with the smartest people in the room who are entrepreneurs. People who have this wild dream of wanting to change the way we live our lives. And nothing is more gratifying to me to work hand in hand with them. We are the largest investors in our own fund. Unlike the Andreessen Sequoia of the world, in our venture fund, the partners put in most of the most of money comes from us partners. So to me, I'm working literally for you and working with you in taking your, your dreams forward. So it is the most gratifying and humbling experience. And it's almost like getting a PhD every day. I get pitched. Uh, Last year, take the world of neuroscience. I'm looking for something in the mental health space or neuroscience space. And I've gotten about maybe 120 companies that pitched me in just neuroscience therapeutics. I didn't fund any, but I learned quite a bit. And, but it's, it's incredible as I get to get exposed to new science that perhaps has not even been published. A lot of these scientists are holding off on publishing because they don't want to get scooped. And they don't want someone else they not, they file their IP. So I get to see things from across the world in doing it. So that's my best experience. Um, in terms of my worst experience, I think it's through my world of consulting, not the consulting experience, but seeing some of the larger companies that are bureaucratic. I still think we live in a world today where knowing people help. It's not true meritocracy. Uh, I think there is an edge for people who are, there's still, whether it's, it's gender, color, pe people, it sometimes seems so over-politicized in these days when people talk about it. But I think it, it really is true in larger corporations. There is still some, some amount where I have seen, uh, and I'll actually even mention names of the people. Uh, I worked really closely with the CEO of Pepsi USA. She's incredible. She's now uh, the CMO of NFL, uh, Don Hudson. She was also on the board of the WPGA. And she was in, invited to, with a large corporation, who, which I will not name as an executive, that she was working temporarily. You will not find it, because she left really quickly. And the executives went on uh, a golf retreat. 
and she did not get invited uh, to it because uh, even though she's on the board of the WPGA. And sitting on the sidelines, when you see experience like this where people get excluded when they are actually really deserve, deserving of it, it's a bit frustrating to see, see that happen right in front of your eyes. And I've had to see that like through like multiple lenses. And, and I'm not just saying in that way, there's a reverse that can happen in San Francisco, so I'll call that out. In San Francisco, which is perhaps overly sensitive to the world of like the world of diversity and inclusion, sometimes it's hard to run a company because if you do promote a white guy for a role that he's deservant of, you get a lot of anger because people say, oh, did you hire that person because you don't want to promote the other person in the room? It's the reverse stigma in the, in the world of San Francisco and New York. I don't have an answer, but it's really sad to me that we live in, we're living through a world where corporations that were largely protected from it can see both sides and both extremes where I don't think there is an answer. I don't know how to win this, but you get to experience it firsthand and no one is the winner. It's not like, a, irrespective of who you are, you're still losing out one way or the other. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so earlier you mentioned like all these salary ranges and I was just wondering how would you negotiate like your offer package or your salary range without being like outrageous or being like super cocky of like what you think you deserve and what like you actually do deserve? So I, I love that question because it's a very practical way of saying so how do you negotiate for where you are? So there are a few things you should do. If it's a company, immediately look on Glassdoor. Have all of you seen that? Like, yeah, great. Look for the salary range of what that role is. Second, an interview process is not one way. They're really lucky to have you. You're interviewing them as much as they're, you, you are being interviewed. Never forget that because the minute you forget that, you think that you're just like, you're not someone's slave. You, you are a valuable asset to that company and make sure you ask for, to talk to three or four people in their company. It doesn't matter if it's a large company like Edwards or a small startup. You want to talk to multiple people to see if you're a cultural fit. So the second thing you should do is try and get a sense of, hey, what is it like in terms of promotions? How quickly do you do it? Do you care about personal development and professional development within the company? Do we move up quickly? I'm pretty ambitious. Do they move that on regular year annual cycles? Or is there off year promotion cycles? Collect all your data points. Then try and understand what the market is. If it's 2008 after the financial crisis, there's not much you can be doing and asking for a lot. In a market like this, San Francisco has a what? 2% unemployment. You're in control. If someone likes you and is about to make you an offer, feel free to ask for what you want. Ask for relocation. Sam in Irvine, I have to move to San Francisco. Can you give me a $10,000 move-in bonus, move, uh, moving bonus or a sign-up bonus, whatever else it is, right? So think about how you want to construct it. Depending on what the company is, your ask has to be in the range of, like, I think the best way is to look for similar comparable companies. And if you don't want to ask the company directly, go on LinkedIn and find another friend, perhaps from UCI, who's gotten a job in a similar industry in a similar company and say, what did you do? And oftentimes, the answer, at least for UCI grads, is people may not have asked for anything at all. So in that case, the best way for you to do it is, on average, if you are getting a 60K offer, let's just say a 70K offer, asking for five to $10,000 for a moving bonus, a sign-up bonus, is not preposterous. If you're getting a 60K offer, asking for a 10K increase in your base, and being super practical in terms of like what it is, if that is, it's completely OK to ask. In fact, ask, and more than likely the answer will be, sorry, we have a standardized system, and this is what everyone gets as an offer, but at least you have tried to ask. And this is another really important thing you should take away. No one is going to take away your job offer for asking. People are always worried. They're worried that by asking, someone's gonna take away and rescind your job offer. No, it makes you a better person and employee for asking. Like, you should ask, ask in a respectful way. Don't be like, hey, like $10,000 or bust. Like, no, it's, it's more like, hey, uh, as I think about my career and consider other opportunities at hand, one thing which would make it more compelling for me to join your company is perhaps an increase from the 60K to 70K. Would that be feasible for your company? 
or if not, would there be a way for you to help me with the relocation expenses? Because as I leave school and look for an apartment, it's important for me to have some upfront cash to be able to finance that, or have loans that I have to take care of. It's absolutely okay to ask. And maybe six times out of, out of 10, you will not get what you asked for. Go in knowing that, but don't, like any job you've ever gotten, including academia, always ask. On the, the same topic of negotiating, um, do you have any advice for negotiating equity with a company? Yeah. So the way in which equity works is in most of companies, you have a four-year vesting period with a one-year cliff. I'm just going to break that down as to what that is. If you join a company and a company gives you 100 shares, they say, look, we'll give you 100 shares in our company, but we don't know you. We don't know if you're going to stick around. You have a one-year period, and if you stick around, you are eligible for that equity. If not, you lose the whole thing. So that's standard. Now, in the world of equity and equ equity negotiations, you need to know like what is like overall how many outstanding shares you have and what percent of the company you have and what it's valued at. So the key question that people forget when they graduate from undergrad is one: if you are joining a startup, please do it for the sake of equity. Why would you join a startup and take a pay cut if you're not doing it for equity? So if you don't believe in it to ask, to ask for the equity, don't join it. Second, keep in mind that there is a vesting period. So if the company tries to fire you before a year for some reason, you will lose it. So even if you do, for some unfortunate reason, get fired, make sure when they're letting you go, or if that were to happen, and hopefully it'll never happen to any of you, but if the market's bad in May, or if the startup, make sure you, you ask for early vesting and you get your shares. Don't leave if you put any time into it without any shares. Third thing which you know, which no one ever tells you, and so many people get screwed, is even if you get shares in a company, you have to buy the options. Yeah. Which is crazy. No one tells you that. So you join a startup, and let's say you get 100 shares. They're priced. You get a cheaper price, you get a discounted price. But when you leave, you have typically 30 to 90 days to exercise your options. If you don't buy your shares in those 90 days, even if you send it on the 91st day, you lose every share you have in the company. All that equity gets back into the startup. I cannot tell you how many people have worked in the worlds of Facebook or in the worlds of Slack or Airbnb today who have left, who have not exercised the options. So if Airbnb has an exit event, these people will make no money. And they put three, four, five years of their life in building these companies. Because no one ever tells you that. So please keep that in mind as you work for a startup. Third, he talked about negotiating. You can negotiate up front and ask for equity. You can also negotiate based on milestones. You could say, hey, early stage company, you don't know me well. I know you only gave me 5,000 shares. But if I come in, I'm the best engineer you've ever met. If it can help you with writing this code and helping you launch this in a month instead of the three months you had planned, can you give me an equity, another grant of another 5,000 shares? So there are a couple ways in which you can negotiate. One, negotiate up front. Just ask for more. Just like your salary, just ask for more. Second, ask for milestone payments, which is totally fair. Why would a startup not want to give you stuff if you help them accelerate their product roadmap from three months to one month? You should get paid for it. And a third is, as you get promoted, as you take on more management, with every event in a startup, which happens a lot in a startup, you'll be moving quite a bit. Or if they tell you you're coming on as X, and you're doing X, Y, and Z, ask for more. And you should have open conversations. So another soft skill to develop is not being embarrassed to put out what you really want. So you ask about soft skills. Each of you, whether you're in academia, whether it's, it's OK to have certain goals of what you want, and it's OK to lay them out, and OK to discuss with your boss of what you want to achieve. And then work out with the CEO, with your boss, with your mentor, with your sponsor, how to get there. And in the world of equity and even as salaries as you try to negotiate, maybe you get that 60K offer, but you see that your friends are getting 80K offers. You can be upfront and say, hey, I really believe that I want to work for your company now. And I don't care about the money because I believe in what we're building. But I would love to show my value is large enough that in a year and a half, 
I'd like to be at 80K. Is that possible? And maybe the answer is no, but then say, OK, what can we do to make that happen faster than normal? My other takeaway, apart from the equity, as you think about, is there are no rules in like, the world of business. Don't stick to the prescribed path that everyone sets that you have to spend a year to get promoted from associate to, I skipped a lot of steps. I've not been out of my PhD for that long. And a large part is it's you get to craft and design your own career. It's like that terrible movie that Netflix put out where you choose your own adventure. How many of you have seen that? What was that? Yeah, Bandersnatch. Yeah, terrible. But it's uh, uh, actually, how many of you like Bandersnatch? Because that's a way to not hire people in the future. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but that is, is actually an innovative concept. But part, part of like, what you should do in your life is actually choose your own adventure and choose what you want to do. right? Based on the path you want to do, figure out like, how you want to get there. And if, if it is the fact that you want to be in VC and you have to do a bunch of different paths to get there, start designing your own TV ad that reads with your own personal brand that reads a little differently. Take those risks that you need to. Network with the people you have to. And be smart about your own self-worth. And don't ever feel embarrassed for who you are. Find your spike early and capitalize on it. Yeah. So I read that venture capitalists rarely invest in inexperienced leaders for startups. They prefer to invest in experienced leaders, even though if they have a really crappy idea. And the inexperienced leaders have a great business plan, great, great idea. So that brings, puts me in a spot of like a catch-22. How would you go about that? Yeah, so he's saying experienced leaders generally get like venture people trying to fund them. Honestly, I haven't seen that to be true. I think that experienced leaders or inexperienced leaders can still get funded. It depends on who you are. If you're inexperienced, build like a scientific advisory board of a science idea of people who are qualified. Bring in business advisors and leaders to supplement your team. Then you're not ex inexperienced anymore. Inexperience is what you make it up to be. It's your ad just shows inexperience if you want to make it seem that way. But what if you were starting something and you knew that you were going to have a tough pitch and Dr. Tang was your co-founder or was a business advisor and you were building a MEMS thing and he's the world's expert on it? Are you inexperienced anymore or do you have the world's expert on it with you? I mean, it's how you position things and how you tell your story. Because you can come in and you can be the person, the lone wolf, trying to sell something or trying to raise money on something. But you will never be successful that way anyway. Good companies don't get built. You may be the, represent, like the person who represents the idea and the great storyteller. But you don't do it as a journey alone. You have to find the people who make you less inexperienced. And that comes in the form of business. It comes in the form of fundraising. It comes in the form, and it comes in the form of diversity of thought, of finding contrarians to your idea. I love having people who I work with who always tell me that, like, hey, you're so full of shit. It's great. It's great because you 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 constantly are in check, and you constantly learn about like the fact that you should never be comfortable and complacent with what you're doing. So make sure with whatever you're doing that you are not doing it alone, and you bring in the right people. All right. All right. Um, so then no more questions. Let's uh, thank Dr. Bailey. Thank you. For a wonderful. <laughs> Can you be around for a uh, couple more minutes? Yeah. yeah. OK. My flight's at 8, so I should be fine, I think. OK. Yeah. So um, if you still have some lingering questions, you're welcome to come up and mingle for just a little bit um, before he actually have to run to the airport. Yeah. Hey.